Good afternoon across Australia. I'm Dante St. James. Welcome to a look at the gig economy and working side jobs and side gigs and some of the pitfalls and the successes you can have from those as well. The chat room is open, so feel free to ask questions along the way. The Q&A is also open. We've got a few of us in the room today, so please do ask those questions if they come up. We've got some more information coming up for you in just a moment about how you can watch this later on, particularly if you're wanting to watch it through things like YouTube. Yeah, I'll just share the screen and hopefully it's sharing the right screen. It usually tells me which one it's sharing. I'm hoping it's got the right one. Let me just um, unshare that because it usually gives me an indicator to say, hey, you're sharing this one. Uh, let's go this one. That's who I'm after. And we're off and racing. So first of all, a quote from John McAfee, who is, um, if you've ever heard of McAfee, uh, McAfee antivirus, it's a um, very, very famous antivirus. And this is a guy who actually made it. The gig economy is empowerment. This new business paradigm empowers individuals to better shape their own destiny and leverage their existing assets to their benefit. And that's very important to look in there is that going into a gig economy job doesn't mean just simply going in and doing any old thing. It means leveraging the things you're already good at, leveraging the things you've already got access to, to give you that space to become really successful at what you're doing. What we're going to look at today is what the gig economy actually is. So you've got a really clear picture of sort of the difference between it and things like self-employment or jobs. We'll look at how it's working in Australia right now, some of the options of different kind of gig economy jobs you can go and do, and some of the things you may want to take a look out for because they can get a little bit nasty if you don't really keep an eye on what you're doing and you just kind of let it get away from itself. This is brought to you in the meantime by Business Station and the Australian Small Business Advisory Services Digital Solutions Program. Business Station presents in WA, Regional Development Australia, Brisbane in Queensland, and Treaty Business Consulting in the Northern Territory, where I happen to be right now. A little bit about me. I work with uh, Facebook Australia as a trainer and digital marketing associate. I'm also working quite heavily across uh, the new business assistance with NICE program, mostly in the Northern Territory in Alice Springs and Darwin, but also a little bit in uh, North Queensland as well. Uh, my own business, Clickstarter, is a digital marketing agency, and I've also done some work with Google's Digital Springboard project. And um, I've got my own training business at the moment, DanteSandJames.com, which um, is about bringing a lot of one to one training to people across Australia, both through the ASBAS Digital Solutions Program and beyond. So when we talk about this gig economy, what this actually, what this thing actually means, it's something that's a bit different than say going for a job and being employed by someone. The gig economy essentially is a bit like a trapeze. So if you've ever been to the, the circus or ever been on a trapeze, you know that it tends to be these moments of like rush, 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 and then stop and then turn and then change and then do something else and then up and then down. And then one minute you're flying through the air, next minute you might be crashing down to earth. Hopefully you've got a safety net underneath you. I bring the whole trapeze thing because sometimes you are, you're going really, really slow. And sometimes you're just dead still and just trying to hold your place. But sometimes you're flying so fast and there's so much work to get done that you don't know how you're literally going to get all that work do it going. Now I'm in the middle of one of those flying periods at the moment where I've got so much work on and so many things happening. I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to get them all done. For me, it's a matter of time management. It's a matter about breaking my entire day into 15 minute slots and making sure that I'm as effective and working as quickly and as far as I can while still having some sanity, having some downtime, some rest and trying to eat and sleep properly as well. So to master your participation in something like the gig economy, just like the trapeze, you need a bit of discipline, a lot of discipline, probably a lot of practice too for that matter. I'm not gonna hop up on that thing just Oh, finally, you know, thank you. Um, you need to have a safety net. So you need to make sure that the things that are in place to catch you if you should fall are in place. Sometimes you need to have equipment. You need the right equipment in order to be able to do those things. For instance, my part of the gig economy involves me being on webinars quite a lot and doing a lot of one-to-one -one training. That means I need to have a computer and a backup computer because having my computer break down in the middle of something, it's not an excuse. I'm going to have a backup ready to go. If this goes out and this computer crashes in the middle of this webinar, I need to be able to reach over my bag, pull out my other computer, plug it in and get going and continue where I left off. So you might find that sometimes it's a car that you need or a, 
a, a scooter even, like a moped to be able to get around town. And the other really important factor in there is support. One of the big um, miscommunications that's come out about the gig economy and side hustles is that you're all on your own and there's no help whatsoever. But what you do find that you tend to connect with other people in a similar situation where you've got support. If you can't make that delivery, you can call on someone who can. If you can't make that job, you can call on someone who can. If you're really, really low on work at the time, you can call on those who you know who have too much and are more than happy to share some of that work with you. So it's just about having the discipline to be able to do this on your own because no one's telling you to do it, having a safety net to fall on so that this is not the only source of income you've got, having the equipment to be able to do the job, and also having some backup, having a bit of support. And sometimes it's not job support. Sometimes it's just moral support, someone to actually give you a little bit of a, a pep talk to be able to help you to get on and get, done, get on with the job and keep going. Because sometimes it is hard. So what kind of work do you have in the gig economy? Now, some of the most obvious kinds of work that we look at and that we often consider is things like food delivery driving. And we see it in every city around Australia where there's you know, Uber Eats or Deliveroo or Menu Log or um, DoorDash is the most recent one to hit our shores as well. The ability to be able to order food from restaurants and have it delivered to you via a service as well. So those delivery drivers are what we call the gig economy. They're not employed. They're certainly not casual employees. What they are is that they are um, contractors too. Sorry, a very um, specific company. So it could be Uber for Uber Eats or Menulog or Deliveroo or DoorDash. And what they do, they get paid per delivery. So that's how they get paid. There's a certain amount they get paid per delivery. And then a lot of the times, the extra money they make is based upon tips. So we've got the American style tipping system where it's between five and 20% that you can often, that you can, um, you can put in there. Um, I, when it's a lower amount, I tend to tip about 20% myself. I know how hard these people work for what they get and they don't get a lot of pay for it. So for them to get a tip essentially can double the amount that they're being paid for that single delivery. The other thing is of course, ride sharing or Uber, Uber, DD, uh, Ola, Shiba, um, who am I missing? I'm missing one, I'm sure of it. Ola, Shiba, Didi, Uber. Look, there's so many of them now. Hello, Oscar is the other one. That's the one I was thinking of. And these are all based on the gig economy as well. Uber is not employing people. Ola is not employing people. You are your own boss with your own ABN and you do your own work. So what it is, it's just a system that you become a driver for. And then you essentially, it's up to you for how much work you do. So you can say, I'm only going to do this for maybe an hour a day. Or you can say, you know what, this is now my primary thing that I do mostly. And that's it. Naturally, Uber's not going to give you a car. Ola's not going to give you a car. It's your car. And it has to live up to certain standards. And we'll have a little bit of a look at that later on. Other things can be things like graphic design and web design. It could be advisory services where you are advising people. Marking exams is a really important one. Or things like doing what I'm doing now, hosting webinars. It's actually also a very important one as well. Then there's markets. We didn't believe it, but markets are a bit of a gig economy as well because basically um, you are the person who's getting paid to be there, but you may not necessarily be the owner of the market store. People who um, are salespeople can often be done in the gig economy. So they're only selling this product today, but tomorrow they might be selling it to someone else. In fact, gig economy is um, probably easy to wrap up in, you know, people who, um, who do supermarket demonstrations. We haven't had any during COVID obviously, but there's been um, a lot of those demonstrations in supermarkets. So you do a taste test of maybe some jams or taste test of some cheese or a new product. That's a gig economy thing too. Those people are not employed by the company there. They do taste testings and demonstrations and samples for all sorts of different companies. So the one that you see them in this time just happens to be the one that they were doing on that particular day. It can be people who are more obviously the original gig economies, I guess, is the artists, the musicians, the artists, the painters, the theatre, the actors who their actual 100% of their whole income comes from doing gigs. And that's um, essentially where it came from. The bands don't get paid until they do gigs. They need to do gigs, which is basically shows. So it's just a way of saying they're doing a gig, they're doing a show, and that's a similar thing. So none of these things get paid unless you actually do the work. 
So it's not like you can go and fill a seat in an office and pretend to work for a day and no one will really notice. In this case, you don't do the work, you don't do the sale, you don't do the thing, you don't drive the car, you don't deliver the food, then you don't get paid. Very, really simple. So that's, about, I guess, the, the most the fundamental um, gig economy, uh, I guess, definition is you don't work, you don't get paid. So it's also known, obviously, as freelancing. So it's the same thing where you, you don't have a boss. Um, it can be called contracting sometimes, although not contracting, say, for six, 12 months, that kind of thing, just short-term contracts. Um, the side hustle is another one right here where you're taking on a side job to a job you're already doing. There's so many Uber drivers and delivery drivers in the country right now who work a full-time job during the day. And for a few hours at night, they'll drive for Uber as well to make some extra cash on the side. And it's also what we know as the home-based business as well. Most people who work from home are not, well, before COVID, we're not working for a company. They're working for themselves and doing a home-based side job. The whole thing about the gig economy is that it's based around having no boss and no set hours, which is a big one for me. I hate being told to work from nine to five. I want to be able to work the hours that I want to work. If I want to work late into the night, damn, I can do it. I can do it. It's up to me. But likewise, it's just as good to have no boss. There's no one person I have to report to who's the person who decides what I'm going to spend and how I'm going to work and, and, and what I'm going to earn as part of my job. I attend, I'm the one who sets the, the dimensions for how I work. And it's, it feels like a great thing. It's a lot of freedom. But at the same time, as we'll gather a bit later, with great freedom comes great responsibility as well. And of course, like we said before, the more you work, the more you're going to earn. So how does all this work in the context here in Australia? What is the position we're in when it comes to, I guess, freelancing and the gig economy and how people in Australia tend to be doing this? Well, it's growing very fast. It's the first trend I can tell you about the gig economy. Three and a half percent of the workforce in 2013 were involved in what we call the gig economy now. Now it's 7.2%. So it's been a large, I think COVID in 2020 really did a lot to push forward the idea of people working for themselves, especially when so many people lost so many jobs. The second trend is that it, while there might be 2 million self-employed people in Australia, which can count for people like, you know, tradies, um, you know, we're talking um, uh, like plumbers and electricians and those kind of guys, a lot of those are self-employed. But out of that 2 million, 550,000 of us are in what we call the gig economy. And that's all those things we were talking about before, from bands to web designers, to people who don't have jobs uh, and they work from gig to gig, job to job, contract to contract, often in very quick succession. So let's have a look at some broad options that you can take advantage of when it comes to the gig economy. Now, I'm just going to quickly turn off my video just because I think it's getting in the way and I just um, want to open up the screen a little bit more easily for you to be able to see. Let's turn it off. Off we go. So broad option number one I'm going to give you, and, be, and trust me, these are very, very broad, broad definitions. So we've got the delivery drivers and the people drivers. So when it comes to people driving and delivery driving, there is most certainly a lot more red legislation in place when it comes to driving people. So you'll need a specific class of license in just about every part of Australia to be able to do driving like Uber or any of those ride sharing companies. So it is easy to get into as long as you've got a car, but you do need a vehicle. No one's going to give you a vehicle for that. There are options though where you can actually rent or lease a vehicle for Uber work. So you will do your Uber work. Let's just say you have a good night, you make $200. So you might have to pay, you know, three or $400 a week to have access to that vehicle to be able to do that work. So if you're making $200 in a night, if you're going to be paying $400 for the week for this particular car to have access to it, then you have to go, well, it's going to take me two nights out of five to make my money back. So I'm not making money until I do uh, day number three, four, and five. So that's something to really bear in mind if you're renting or leasing a vehicle specifically to do this kind of thing. It also is a problem 
because you need public liability insurance and you'll need potentially something like workers' compensation insurance, only if you are, for instance, letting other people use your car to do this kind of thing. They essentially become almost like, um, like an employee where you have to be covered by insurances. And there's some licenses you need to get. They're mainly around the passenger rating that you can get. So a license which allows you to take paying passengers to places. It can also be really, really seasonal. So for instance, if you're in somewhere like the Gold Coast, where the summer season is madly full of people, but winter is really quite quiet, you'll find that there's a lot more Uber drivers present than what in the summer than what there is in winter. Or it's just the fact that there's a lot of Uber drivers on the road even in winter, but not a lot of them are actually making very much money because there's not as much demand for what they do. The similar thing happened with taxis in Broome, where I was in Western Australia, just a couple of days, or just yesterday, actually, I got, I got home from Broome. And what I found over there is the last time I went there, which is in the off season, there was not many taxis. In fact, I was told there's only six taxis and drivers in the whole town. When I got in this time, though, in the middle of the peak season, there's tons of taxis. There must be at least 30 to 40 taxis in town, and they're always being used but it was much easier to get a taxi because the load was shared across a lot more people. So you find that seasonal things do affect the, um, the, the success of someone who's working on these systems. You also find that rates rise and fall. Um, Uber has had a bit of a, um, bit of a mixed reception lately because I've found that due to the amount of what, the amount that the drivers are getting paid has dropped recently, really recently, like in the last month. What it's meant is a lot of people have come off the system and gone to either other systems like uh, like Ola or Didi, and they've just not been on Uber. So when I look up a car to come and get me on Uber in a peak season in my town, Darwin, then I find that number one, there's not that many cars available. And number two, to get a car is on surge pricing. And when I talk surge pricing, the usual cost for me to get from my place in the city to the airport is about $28, $29. The surge pricing that I had um, back on Sunday when I was going to Perth, uh, going to Broome, uh, so Sunday last week, not this week, was $80. So that was to go to, to Cairns I was going to. I've, I've been to a lot of places in the last week. And um, I was $80 to get that due to surge pricing. Now, that was partially because it was a busy time, but also partially because there was not many Uber drivers around because so many of them have left the system. And we're also finding too, that a lot of people, as the economy is improving again post-COVID, that a lot of what we call traditionally low-paying work, like Uber driving and, and delivery driving for, for dinners and all that, has kind of slipped a bit because, well, we've found that, that people want to have more, you know, more control over the kind of work they're doing. They don't want to be quite so, I guess, subjected to the problems that come with being um, in, in a gig economy job, where they don't have anywhere near as much control over it all. So it's all you know, looking at that and going, well, is it really worth doing a gig economy job or do I need something that's going to be paying more and is going to be a little bit more reliable? And finally, it can be a false economy for some people. I know that it can be a little bit hard when you're doing driving, that you're spending so much on the maintenance of a vehicle, so much on the cleaning of a vehicle, so much on the running and the purchasing of a vehicle, that it can get really expensive when it comes to you know, how much you actually make from driving people around based on the fact that you know a, a fare could be as little as $5 or as much as $50. You have to do quite a lot of it. You need to do a lot of drives. I look at some people who have been only driving for three months on Uber and I can see on the app that they've done over 2,000 rides with people. So that's, it's a big volume game that you need to play. It also favours people who own their own cars outright and are not paying them off. If you're paying off a car, that cost is actually going to be quite a big drag on your, on your ability to make money because you're having to pay off not just your regular stuff every week, but also having to pay off the car at the same time as you're trying to make a little bit of money off what traditionally is a pretty low paying kind of role. So if you can afford to have paid off your car at some point, at some point, then you might actually be in a position where this could be a really good idea for you. Second one. Um, so a bit, a few hot tips here. Actually, I've got hot tips after all of these. So 
a hot tip for driving is you can work across multiple systems. The beauty of this is that if someone is driving for Uber, they can also drive for Ola, they can drive for Didi, they can drive for Oscar, they can drive for any of those ride sharing systems. The same with the delivery of food. If you're driving, if you're delivering for Uber, you can also deliver for Menulog or for DoorDash or whatever is operating in your town or city. So don't feel like you can just work for one, you can work for many so that you can then start to leverage off the, the possibility that sometimes DoorDash will be busier than Uber Eats will be, and sometimes DD will be busier than what Uber is. But you also need to know the perks of each of these systems. Some of them are very, very different in what they offer to others. For example, when it comes to Uber, if you're an Uber driver, you have access to a very large discount when it comes to petrol at Woolworths, uh, Caltex, um, the Ampol now, Woolworths and Ampol um, service stations. So for instance, you can save up to 14 cents, I think it is, a litre when it comes to um, what you pay at the pump compared to what you would normally pay. So that's a pretty decent amount of um, reduction in the cost of fuel. You won't necessarily get that from other systems. You might also be worth knowing of how you use these systems as a user rather than just as a driver and understand that you've also got the possibility of getting great perks as a rider on these systems. So for example, um, riding on Ola gives you Virgin Australia points if you've linked your system to it. So you never know what you're gonna get as downstream value from some of these. And then the same is like when you've got um, access to like a, a network of, of um, people who can help you with mechanical issues and that if you're on particular ride sharing systems. So make sure you don't just check out what you're paid, check out what the perks are as well. Because whilst you may get paid more of a percentage of the ride on DD or an Ola, what you're saving in fuel may actually negate that out when it comes to what you're actually getting paid on each of those systems once you've paid for all the things you need to pay for. You can also set yourself up as an independent driver and most people don't realize this. But once you've got the license to be able to do this, you don't have to go through Uber. You don't have to go through Ola. You can set up your own system. In fact, that's exactly what some smaller regional towns have done in Australia, where they've had no access to these big companies coming to their town. So people have set up their own ride share businesses. You can do the same and people can just book you as a ride share operator in your town. I know there's someone in uh, Atherton Tablelands in um, it just sort of west of Cairns have decided to do that as well. So they don't have an Uber service outside of Cairns. So up in the Atherton Tablelands, one woman has set herself up as her own sort of independent Uber. So she can provide that because she's got the licenses that it takes to do it. To find out more about those licenses, by the way, you just need to visit your, your motor vehicle registry, whatever the, the, the equivalent is in your particular state or territory, and they can let you know what kind of license you need and permits you need to operate as an independent driver like that. Next up is the work from home sector. Now, this is general people who just have work they can do in bits and bobs from home. So it could be everything from a copywriter, someone who's writing copy for ads, writing copy for websites, someone who may be doing data entry, somebody who could be um, doing sort of like a lot of uh, sales outreach, inbound and outbound calls, that kind of thing. This sort of stuff is pretty easy to get into and doesn't require a lot of experience. It also doesn't pay ridiculous amounts either, but it's very much one of those jobs where it's, the more you do, the more you get paid. So look for these kind of things. You can often find them on all the regular job boards, but you'll also tend to find them quite heavily advertised in places like Facebook. Um, whilst they are easy to get into, there's a few things you do need to have. Obviously a computer, obviously a phone, and good internet. Good internet is going to be your friend because so much of what you're going to be doing is on Zoom calls and that kind of thing, particularly with team meetings, where even though you're not an employee, you need to attend those meetings so you can stay in touch with what's going on. There are fewer insurances involved here. You're not going to need to have, for instance, public liability insurance necessarily because nobody is coming to your premises. So that's not necessarily a thing you'll need to have. Although if you're operating in certain government supported um, uh, schemes like the NICE, uh, NICE program, the New Enterprise Incentive Scheme, uh, you will need some insurances with that. Sometimes if you're doing stuff that involves giving advice or perhaps doing some work on people's 
websites on their digital assets like their social media, you may require something called um, professional indemnity insurance. So this particular insurance ensures you against when you mess up on something like, for instance, losing someone's login or messing up their um, what's uh, what's on their, their social media or something to that degree where it's publicly showing that you've made a mistake and it causes a little bit of reputational damage, then your professional indemnity insurance allows you to cover for that if someone decides to sue you. There's no license you need to do for this, but yeah, there is a need for you to market yourself. So work from home people can be people like, for instance, um, bookkeepers and accountants who may choose to work from home um, to not have the traditional business set up, but they just want to do some a little bit of work here and there. So tax time comes and they want to do a little bit of work. Um, you know, school marketing time comes and, and former teachers want to do a little bit of extra work. So they'll do some marking of those exams. Uh, so you do need to market yourself and put it out there that you're doing what you're doing. That doesn't always have to be in the form of ads. It can be, for instance, flyers, business cards, um, local business networking setups, all that. Pretty low investment to get in, unless you need to go and buy yourself a computer. Um, if you do, you can actually rent computers these days. Like I rent one of my main computers, my actual main computer, I rent from a place called Music Corp. So Music Corp, or um, also known as Tech Corp, uh, Techno Corp, they um, rent out Macintosh computers, Microsoft computers, different kinds of computers at a monthly cost. So you're not having to buy the whole thing up front. So you might find that, okay, if you can afford um, $75 a month, you can get a pretty good um, computer for that. I paid $250 a month and I get an absolute screaming top of the range, super powerful MacBook Pro. And that does the work I do. Now for the work I do, $250 is not much to be paying considering how much this computer helps me make. Otherwise though, it's a fairly low investment phone, computer, a place to work from in the house. You don't necessarily have to set up a, uh, an office, but it's probably recommended that you have some place that's very um, suited towards your working. You will find though, there might be very specific skills that are required, such as typing speed or expertise in a certain area to come from these work from home jobs. A hot tip would be to set up a space for you to work that's separate from your life. Um, it's very tempting to not do any work and then just sit there and watch TV because Judge Judy came on or Bold the Beautiful Zone, it's time to sort of put down tools or you need to get some household stuff done. Now, I'd like to be able to mop the floor at the moment because it's not filthy, but it's kind of getting to that point, but I have to work. So I've got to make sure that, okay, as much as I'd like to clean the bathroom and mop the floor and do the laundry, I've got to work first and then I'll come back. So treating your work from home like work would be in an office. It's pretty important. You want flexibility, but at the same time, it's not all of us are as disciplined as others when it comes to getting this work done. So you might find that you need to grow that discipline a little bit more. Also understanding that if you have clients visit you in your home or in your workplace of work where people will come and visit you or clients will come in or delivery drivers will come in, any of that sort of stuff, you will need to have public liability insurance because what that indemnifies you against is if someone falls and breaks their leg or falls and puts out an eye or something like that, you will be sued for things like that. So they've got to make sure that you're covered so you can actually make that. So you want to be able to make sure that you're able to cover that kind of thing if it ever does come up. You also need to understand the cyber risks of using your own technology. So for instance, if you're if you are logging into um, major company systems or somebody else's website, or you've got access to somebody else's Facebook account or Facebook page, if you're hacked and they get hacked, you are liable for that because you've allowed someone to get in through your systems to get into then your client systems. They may have their own cyber security insurance, but it will be helpful if you're dealing with other people's systems and logins that you get cybersecurity insurance just in case. Um, I'm very, very well versed on cybersecurity and I've got very tight systems myself. The problem is though, that even if someone really, 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 really desperately wanted to hack into me and they do hack in, then I'm kind of got problems because I may not be able to be able to fight them off with the setup I've got. So it's good to have that insurance just in case so the inevitable, the, the, the worst happens and I get sued for it. The other thing from working from home is get ready for higher power bills because 
I don't know where you live, you may not need it, but I definitely need aircon all year round during the day. So I'm having aircon running all day long, big screens running all day long, lights running, I've got computers running, I'm using the coffee machine more, going to the fridge more often. That's going to use a lot of extra power. So be ready for a higher power bill if you're going to be working from home. Most people don't tell you about that, um, but it is a realistic thing that happens. You are going to use a lot more power. If you've got solar panels on the roof though, you should be doing pretty well, be doing it all for you. Now we come into the area where singers, dancers, artists, performers, and um, bands, all that kind of thing. So this can be very hard to go into, and it takes a lot of talent and connections to start to build your following or to build your way of um, moving forward. There are fewer insurances involved. Sometimes um, some performance, some spaces will require you to have your own public liability. So if you I don't know, you sing a song that gets everyone up in arms and they start like rioting or something and <laughs> someone wants to sue you, you're covered for that. Um, that said, you know, there's not really a great deal of need for insurances, but sometimes you will be asked for them. Um, there's pretty much no licenses to perform because usually the venue covers that. Um, or if you're doing your own and you want to do a show, say out in the Botanical Gardens, you might have to get a permit from the council or from the gardens, friends who run the place. Um, there is a need to market yourself. Anyone who's ever had a band, anyone who's ever had artworks they wanted to sell, anyone who's ever done performances, know that you need to market. And that's part of the, the cringy sort of thing you need to do in your life to make sure that you get people knowing who you are so you can get the work. Um, it does take quite a high investment for singers. It could be, you know, decades of training their voices. It could be, you know, for, for, for dancers, it's an investment of a lifetime of learning how to dance. Same with acting. It's a big investment in what you look like, what you sound like, what you move like. Um, and then the other investments, I guess, are emotional investments that you might want to take. So it's going to take a lot of investment in yourself and your self-confidence to be able to step forward and become that kind of worker. Um, if you're not already working in the art space and you'd like to, bear this in mind too, because it can be very very seasonal in most parts of australia most of the art stuff happens during the summer months so you're going to go from anywhere between november through to about march where you're going to have the peak amount of time that people are i guess out and about and doing things doing outdoor things but even indoor things just seem to be so many more in the summer months. When it comes to the more winter months, we tend to shut down a little. We're not going out so much. We're not going to shows so much. Um, that might be different where you are. If you're in, the, in, in the, the, the upper half of Australia where it's more tropical, then our winter months are actually our peak months. So there's a lot more on There's festivals, there's football games, there's all sorts of stuff that may involve people being involved in the arts, doing their gigs. So do bear in mind that this kind of work is also very seasonal, which is why every time you see an actor, um, you're probably also seeing a, a barista because they quite often have to side gig as a barista or something like that to help to supplement the, those months where they don't earn quite so much stuff as an artist or a performer or a band or a singer. Hot tips for you, join arts collectives to get the inside word on gigs. That's where you're going to find out about things that are coming up. That's where you're going to find out things that are going on. It might mean subscribing to groups that are online, um, getting into local um, you know, publications for the arts and for performances and, and shows and gigs. That kind of stuff allows you to get the inside word so you know what's coming and when. Also apply to perform at festivals and exhibitions. That can be a really interesting way for you to get work that's not necessarily um, you needing to drum up a crowd, but it could very well be so you drumming up a crowd, the, the crowd is drummed up for you. Um, all you've got to do is rock up, plug in your mic and off you go. Um, art is also something that can happen really well at markets. So if you're doing pottery, if you're doing visual arts, if you're doing tactile arts, any of that sort of thing can be really good for selling in markets. So whether it's Facebook marketplace or a real live market with a stall, art really suits markets really well. And uh, as I was saying, I was in Broome, on um, this past week and Saturday morning I went to a market and probably about half of the, the stalls there were food, another were probably, you know, oh, actually uh, probably breaking the thirds. There was food, there was art, and then there was, you know, general um, sort of clothing and all that sort of stuff. So I reckon a third of it was artists selling their wares. There was pottery, there was um, visual arts, graphic arts, 
tactile arts, people who make silks, all sorts of stuff, doing some amazing things um, and selling those at the markets. I'd also, if you're playing music, consider that whilst you may be doing um, songs and music for pubs and clubs and you want to play in festivals and you want to be that kind of band who plays in front of large crowds, um, you're not going to get that every week. So it might be worth you know, playing something else. I remember there was a, an 80s band called The Cockroaches and um, they had a couple of like really cheesy kind of um, pop songs they were playing. I remember seeing them at the Caring Bar Hotel in Sydney back in the early 90s. And then a little thing happened called The Wiggles. And it was the cockroaches turned into the Wiggles. They decided there was space there for a, a children's band. And so they became that children's band. And they became a very, very big children's band, worldwide renowned. And now I think they're on the third generation of different Wiggles without any of the originals, I think, still paying a part. So it's actually you know, very, very lucrative to be able to go, yes, I'm playing the things I want to play at this indie night, at this little cafe um, down the laneway on Wednesday nights. I'm playing my pub gig full of covers of Cold Chisel on a Friday night. But then, you know what I'm going to do? Saturday morning, I'm going to be playing kids' parties. And that's what you do. You get to play music. Not always the music you want to play, but you're playing it for different audiences and you're able to keep that cash flow running that much better. If you want to work in something like IT and web design, well then, it's pretty easy to start as long as you have the skills. You do need very specific skills, you know, to be able to build websites or to do graphic design or to help people sort out their IT issues. You might be a reseller of things like NBN broadband, or you could be someone who helps fix people's computers and their iPhones. You do need to market yourself quite extensively for these services, because if nobody knows you're there, they won't come to you. Eventually, you will have this beauty of having you know, a setup where you can just um, have people you know, reach out to you from word of mouth. So they're people who discover who you are through referrals from other people. But until that happens, you're gonna be relying on trying to offer, to trying to attract new people to you from all kinds of backgrounds. So you wanna be doing some advertising on things like Facebook, perhaps even Google, or even going as far as having, you know, ads that you're running on local television, radio, the press, whatever it really takes, I guess, to be able to get you to the point where you can actually um, make enough money to make this thing work for yourself. So when it comes down to a lot of this stuff as well, we're going to find that you need a good one to two years to get momentum in these kind of jobs. This is because you need to create a, a, a market for yourself, um, a way to differentiate yourself from others, prove to the market that you can deliver on what you promise, and to find your unique selling proposition. So your unique selling proposition is basically what's different about me to every other person who's doing this in my town or in my local area or within my industry? Is there something that I'm doing that's considerably different um, than what everyone else is doing? So I can go, yep, I'm definitely doing something different here. I'm definitely doing something better than everyone else here. So therefore I've got something that I can advertise that would attract someone to me. You'll find that these service-based things where you're not actually delivering a physical product, although in IT you could be, that you have pricing challenges. And the temptation is always to go into these things um, very low priced. So you're going at the lowest price possible that you can try and pull, um, and then try and pull in a whole lot of customers who will buy from you because you're cheaper than everyone else. The first lesson you'll learn as you start to do this is that it's not sustainable because you need to charge at least a minimum amount to be able to cover the cost that you need to cover. If you're unable to do that, then what happens is that you're unable to then um, maintain your business because there's no margin in it. Once you've paid for your the equivalent of like you know electricity running, um, air conditioners running, travel costs, all those sort of things, if you don't have the right level of margin on top, then you'll find that, okay, you cannot continue to run this business. I hit that wall about four years ago now and then I had to rapidly increase my rates in order to not just compete, but to be able to survive. And in these areas, you might need some extra insurance like that professional indemnity insurance, because when it comes to web design and logins to people's stuff, um, as well as IT, where you're playing with people's hardware and a lot of the logins as well, you will find that you may need that extra insurance quite simply because if you mess things up, this is people's technology and their livelihood. 
and it just might cause you a bit of a problem if something goes wrong and people are looking for someone to blame they want to blame you and they end up you know being stuck with you know suing you or going through probably usually what happens is they go through their insurance company and that's how they generally sue you when it comes down to the hot tips for that one i'd say when it's doing that sort of um technical work website work graphic design work is to align with others who do what you do or at least who do things similar to what you do for a graphic designer i think it's very important for you to be very close to a web designer um, because you can exchange work between each other very very easily graphic designers don't really want to make websites web designers don't really want to do graphics so if you can find someone to exchange work with you can work on client projects together and, and just get a much better job done more effectively when you're both working in what you're strong with i'd say consider working in a shared workspace as well just being someone who's technically oriented but also a little bit creative i know that if i don't put myself quite often around very motivated people that i'll tend to get a little lazy and my work ethic will start to slip so occasionally i need to go from the home office and work around other people as well thankfully i've got a group that i can work with here and where i live um, but interstate if i'm on the road then i'll find it's probably good to try and go to a shared workspace or even go to a cafe where you can see other people working on their laptops because then being around other people just makes you it just gives you a psychological trick that you go i'm at work i need to work rather than sitting there and just watching the world go by and feeding the pigeons and whatever you do in cafes um, marketing is going to be everything to you uh, it's going to be a lot of personal branding for instance if you're doing things like websites because it's an area that people don't trust the web developers very much they will want you to be um, to know that they're doing the right thing with the right person in the right way so you need to be able to earn people's trust through you know things so, like sales funnels that allow you to um, that allow you to sort of nurture a relationship with people as you're going along so that's what we want to kind of want you to do is to be able to, I guess, have you able to very successfully, um, I guess, put yourself out there and show people what it is you do and who the person is that you are so that people feel safe. They feel safe dealing with you and they don't feel like it's a great risk to be able to do that. Um, your quotes though, for all this kind of work, really do need to be very accurate. They need to be very, very clear on everything that's included and everything that's not included, which is just as important to define. So when you're, you're quoting for things that are technical, quoting for things that involve a creative um, uh, result at the end of it, whether it's you know writing out copywriting or building websites or doing social media management for someone, you really have to be clear on what exactly it is that you're doing, what you're providing, you're not providing what any extra costs may be so there's no surprise at the end and there's no one coming back to you saying i think you ripped me off because i was supposed to get this and i didn't get this and okay i got that so yeah please do be very very clear on these things it's very important then there's the markets people the markets people have a very low startup cost although it could be well, it might cost you only a thousand dollars to get a tent or a marquee to be putting up um you will need to do that stuff so no one's going to supply generally that stuff for you that's the stuff you're going to have to pay for yourself so even though the low startup cost compared to going to a shop there is insurance required you will require public liability insurance um, if you have employees or people working for you in that market stall you will also require um workplace uh, sorry um workers compensation insurance or work cover insurance there will be market fees involved so you don't get to go to the markets for free you actually have to pay to be there some of those markets can be quite expensive at the form in the form of you know two three hundred dollars a day but um others are like you know 30 bucks as not because that council it might be a council that's providing that market space if you're selling food you will need to be health inspected and checked to make sure that you're properly handling food correctly if you're selling alcohol you'll need responsible service of alcohol certification and any sort of licenses that come with that as well markets are highly seasonal and highly subjective to weather so if it's raining really hard you're not going to get anyone turning up to the market so while you might have had ten thousand people walking past your stall last week this week 
you may not have anybody walk past if it's raining. So just bear in mind, it can be very, very up and down. Markets also tend to do better when the sun's shining rather than when it's cold. Um, and it also depends on what kind of market it is. If your market is a food market with lots of organics, fruit and veg and local products and local produce, then you're gonna find yourself in a position where people um, are, are, may not be really resounding with the kind of thing you're selling at this kind of year, particularly if you're selling truly seasonal produce. So understand that seasonal and weather factors can affect that. Uh, another little thing that people, people can tend to get caught on is exclusivity. If you're trying to set up, for instance, a, um, I know that every market seems to have this little mini Dutch pancake stall. Every market has one, the poffages or whatever they're called. Those little things are like, you know, uh, almost like the, the, the poster child for the exclusivity. If there's one Dutch pancake place in that market, there can't be another. Um, most markets will do this. They'll go, well, I've already got 13 places selling tie-dyed crap from barley, so we can't have any more tie-dyed crap from barley places. We've got to sort of limit it to the amount that we've already got. Markets do have long hours. You are on your feet for a long time. You're talking to lots of people. It can be a real hard slog. And when it comes down to it, you can work for eight hours one day on your feet, in the hot, in the sweat, in horrible conditions, and still not make much money. You can walk away with $500 on one day, and you walk away with 25 bucks on the next. So it can be really soul destroying when you go there week after week after week to do this thing and you don't seem to be moving any product your markets generally require a lot of volume the whole point of going and selling something at the markets is you're selling stuff that you can move at high volume so this is where a lot of people like artists get really caught up they try and sell one thousand dollar paintings and think well if i just make one painting here i'm gonna that's gonna make enough to justify my markets for the whole year no one goes to the markets to buy $1,000 paintings. They'll go to the markets to buy a $30 copy print of that painting. They'll go to the markets to see a tea towel with that print printed on it. They'll go to the markets and buy a stubby cooler with that art print printed on it, but they're not going to buy the $1,000 painting. So you're going to make sure that you are stocking things that you can sell lots of. That's why food goes so well at markets because you can sell a lot of food, a lot of snow cones, a lot of mango slushies, a lot of um, pad thai. You can sell tons and tons and tons of it because it's food. It keeps getting turned over and turned over. Likewise, if you're going to sell something that's really popular, be it essential oils, handmade soaps, handicrafts, make sure that you have it priced. So it's either a reasonable price to get what you get for it or lots of cheap little stuff that you can sell tons and tons and tons of because you're far better making you know, a dollar on selling a thousand things than selling one thing for $500 and then selling nothing else. So yeah, high volume is what you want to be in a market for. Um, it's also what makes enough money to justify you being in that market in the first place. To get on buy markets, look to markets that don't already do the same thing that you do. So for instance, if you have the Dutch pancakes, Make sure you get on market doesn't have Dutch pancakes, eh? Yeah, good plan. Plan to be at two to three markets per week. You're not going to make a heck of a lot of money out of one a week. You've got to really commit to this. Um, markets are not a place that you're going to be able to make a million. You're not going to make your millions from the markets, put it that way, unless you have a fleet of 30 different vans going around to 30 different markets on a Saturday and they're all selling, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of Dutch pancakes. It just, it just doesn't work that way. Um, sell what you can carry. That's generally a good idea. It has to be able to fit into the vehicle you're going to because you can't just pull up a giant truck all the time um, without prior planning. So if you've got really large things you want to sell, they probably go better at being sold at your premises. Try and sell the small things, the things you can fit in the car or the van or the ute to be able to take there. Bring your own marquee all the time and tables and chairs bring lots of water, otherwise you'd be buying cold water from vendors at the markets. I think it's the thing that sells more than anything else is cold water. Um, and account for the idea of theft and spoilage. 
Unfortunately, shoplifting is a way of life in Australia and you're going to have, especially in markets where things are crowded, you get distracted by talking to one person while next thing a, a teenager has swiped a pair of earrings um, without you even noticing. So just account for the fact that you're going to lose some stuff in you know, spillage, spoilage and a bit of theft as well. Unfortunately, it's, it's a sad fact of doing markets. You're going to lose some stuff. And the final area I want to look at is advisory services. With advisory services, you definitely need additional insurance in the form of not just public liability, but also you'll need professional indemnity insurance. Um, these advisory businesses, they tend to be more around mobile services. So they could be mortgage brokers, financial advisors who are actual licensed financial advisors. Thank you. And also you can be working with, I guess, um, you know, different things like uh, you know, tech advisory services or system advisory services like I work in right now. This is, this is my kind of area. I work in this area. Um, you can be online, but just recognize too that some people like to see you in person if they're in the same town as you. So you may need to be mobile as well. Um, you will definitely, most certainly, absolutely and completely positively have to market yourself you'll need to build your personal brand so people know who you are you'll need to get known you'll then need to be able to get found on things like google and then you want to be able to stay known so people can come back to you again and again and again and do more work with you and you also need your credentials and a lot of online presence so you're going to need to be where people are you're going to need to have a presence in google through google my business You'll need to have a presence on Facebook and LinkedIn so people can know that you're serious and to be taken seriously. And those credentials can be anything from your certifications through to your accreditations with different government organizations, or it could be just as simple as I've helped these businesses, here's their logos. You can check with them if you want to, to see how I went with them. Some hot tips when it comes to advisory. Try and align with some government programs that will make your life so much easier in those areas that you are doing advisory services. I'm doing advisory services through both the Northern Territory, the Queensland and New South Wales governments. I'm also doing work with a federal government, two federal government programs at the moment. So I've made it so that I've got those things which come like my safety net in a way. So they help me when my own business stuff, when my own stuff that doesn't involve government programs starts to run small and my stuff run short and run dry, I've got these ones I can always fall back with. I help find it helps if you align with other advisors and use professional associations for insurance. So for instance, I've joined the Australian Computer Society and the Australian Computer Society actually gives me for free with my $30 a month or $300 a year package with them, um, my public liability and professional indemnity insurance as well. So that's a very good value for me able to do that because then I don't need to worry about them going and paying extra stuff for my, inf my, my public liability and professional indemnity, which immediately saves me a ton of money because that itself, it costs me about probably about a thousand dollars a year to get both of those insurances separately. If I get it under this one thing with the Australian Computer Society, because I work in that area, it's then only $300 a year, plus I get membership to the organization, which gives me a whole lot of other training and other materials as well. And it also helps if you do a lot, a lot of networking. So as we start to draw to the conclusion, I want to take you on a bit of a journey through how I manage all this. And this is the point where I'll probably turn back on my uh, video so you can uh, have a look at the fact that it is me. Hi, back again. So my own journey through this has been very much around um, a step, four steps. I call it define. So I want to define who my customer is. I want to define what their needs are. I want to define what I can do, what the things that I'm actually able to do, and also match up what their needs are with something that I can do. So what it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm always going to successfully be able to match that up. Sometimes I've made some tests and released some time or a product or a service, and it really has not gone well because I've been, unfortunately, mismatched I've, I've gone and tried to do something that nobody was actually looking for and lost a lot of money for it so step one definitely is define the step two oh, come on you can work step two is test so i spend about three months testing any one product or service that i'm going to offer then i want to say is this working i can't say that within a week and it may feel like you're going to wait three months to be losing money hand over fist if that's the case bear in mind i'm working about seven different contracts and i've got lots of different 
little um, ways of getting income. So I'm not reliant upon any one thing. So when I'm doing a test, I've still got other things paying for my life. So I'm, this is just the new stuff I want to do. Spend about three months and then ask myself, is it working after three months or does it even look like working? If the answer is no, then I'll ask for feedback from the people who I did have in the survey and say, hey, what was this about? Um, why didn't you go forward with it? All that sort of thing. And then consider that if I was trying to actually force something that actually doesn't have a need, maybe what I was doing was trying to do something that nobody actually wanted or needed in their lives. Then we refine. I refine based on what I've learned back. I collect the feedback. I build some new business ideas out of that, then start to market this new idea. And then I get ready to take bookings. So remember it's um, define, then test, then refine. And then finally, once I've done that, I then start to go next. So releasing the new business, spending the three months again, see if it works and repeat that process over and over to see if that's something I want to take on. My original business was a loyalty program that built an app for, released it to the market that didn't need it. And then when I did my feedback period with the people who did participate with it, they told me in the end that here's the things we really needed to be done. Um, we didn't need this thing. We needed all these other things. And I went, oh, okay. That's really good to know. Now I know what I should have done in the first place. And through that, I built Clickstarter, which has gone on to be a successful business on its own right. So, and the training side of what I do all came out of the fact that I was trying to do a, a tutorial service that was going to people. What they wanted to do is just, you know, rather than, um, you know, have these ad hoc problems when they have a problem come up and just call someone, what they wanted was to avoid those problems ever happening before. So they wanted to uh, subscribe to a service that they could use regularly and keep their momentum going they want someone to sort of coach them along the process of doing that so the reality check when it comes to these gig economy businesses and try and, and jobs is that you are responsible for everything in this you are responsible for your tax it doesn't get removed for you you're responsible for your own accounts and your own insurance nobody's going to do any of this for you you have to go and do it secondly there is no safety net there's no superannuation. You need to put away your own superannuation. There's no injury protection. Unless you've got health insurance, or you've got life insurance, things like that, they may count for it, but there's no built-in sort of way that if you get injured on the job, you get paid for the next three months while you're um, recuperating. Then there's the slow days. There's no beating a slow day because sometimes the work just does not come. So just because the work doesn't come, doesn't mean you turn to your boss and say, make the work come. You're not gonna get paid if you don't have any work. Diversifying is really important because it allows you to spread your risk and to watch out for seasonality in your business that you're running. It also helps you if you avoid more than 60% of your money coming in, coming from any one particular source. At the moment, I'm sitting on about 55% on one of my sources of income out of seven. That's making me very, very uncomfortable. So I'm at the point where I need to go, hmm, I need to diversify again and find a new source of income so that I'm not stuck at having this one source of income being the primary thing I'm doing. And if I lose it, everything goes horribly wrong. I've also got legal obligations. You need sometimes special licenses. Sometimes you have what health inspections you need. Sometimes it's against your lease conditions to run a business from your home. You gotta consider whether these are things you're allowed to do or not, or whether you have to go through other channels to get approvals to do those things. And of course, there's the admin. Invoicing, your bookings, your capacity management are all things that you need to handle on your own. Can you take on more work at the moment? Great. Can you not take on more work? You've got to stop taking on work if you can't actually get it done. My books are closed for three months because I've got too much work on at the moment. So sometimes you need to learn how to say no, understanding that just because that money goes missing for you now doesn't mean that that money will never come to you ever again. If you need help, you can get in contact with Business Australia. Now they're a great source of all sorts of questions to do with, um, it's free membership too. Great source of information for anything to do with um, industrial relations, work sort of um, workers and employee kind of stuff that you might need to find out, as well as things like licenses for businesses and such. Flying Solo is an excellent micro business community. I, I really, really hope you will join. Um, there's a lot of great discussions in there. Most of it's free, it's great, like articles and case studies that join, I guess, yourself as a giga, 
with all the other giggers in the world, or in Australia as well. It's a great little community there. So are you ready to fly solo? If you are, what is next for you is making sure that you can take advantage of the ASBAS Digital Solutions Program. First consult is $0 if you've never had one before. Second is 44 and your third and any after it for $66. And you can do that through asbas.com.au or reach out to me and I can help you set it up. Dante at treaty.com.au. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I hope you've got some great value out of that. If you've got any questions at all, please do shoot them through that email address or you can go and stalk me happily at Facebook, LinkedIn, or Instagram as well. My name again is Dante St. James. I thank you so much for joining me. It's been a fun afternoon, and hopefully that you'll get yourself going on the way to growing a great gig economy business so that you can take a lot more control of your life and not feel like you're so much subjected to the moods and the, and the feelings of bosses. It's a great thing not having.